Niagara Falls, near the city of Buffalo in western New York State. Niagara Falls, whose mighty flow of water provides hydroelectric power to the northeastern United States. Niagara Falls, traditionally chosen as a honeymoon spot by newlyweds from all over the USA. The thousands of visitors who flock to this tourist attraction each year are unlikely to be aware that, as well as being honeymoon country, this is Indian country. They may know that the name Niagara is Indian. It means the thunderer of waters. But they probably don't know about the 10,000 Indians in New York State. They belong to the Iroquois League, a federation older than the United States itself. The Six Nations of the Iroquois League still maintain that they are a sovereign state, independent of the USA. Turtle Clan Chief of the Onondaga Nation, Orrin Lyons. The Six Nations are the Senecas, who are the keepers of the western door. The Cayugas, who lie in between they and the Onondagas, who are the central fire. To the east are the Oneidas, and further than that, the keepers of the eastern door are the Mohawks. A Six Nation was entered into and that was the Tuscarora Nation who came from uh, the Carolinas during time of great strife. We first protect our land base. We must safeguard that, and that's a treaty. We are a sovereign, independent nation. We are different. We are not part of the United States. We are not citizens of the United States. We are Ungwehoe Odunashoni, and we maintain our own government. We have our own language. We have our own ways of life, we have um, all of these things that make a nation. Many of the Iroquois are proud to call themselves traditionalist, which means rejecting the American way of life in favor of a self-sufficient existence on their own land. They prefer their children to learn traditional ways of recording history on wampum belts, and their Indian way schools are run independently of any federal or local authority finance. We refuse money from the state or the federal government because every time the government, whether it be state or federal, gives a penny to an Indian person, it has strings attached to it. It tells you what you have to do with this money. All they see is progress, and uh, it's sad because Indian way is not progress, it's living. Of course, there are a large number of Indians whose way of life is virtually identical to that of their white neighbors in upstate New York. Many of them are practicing Catholics, and there are long-established Catholic churches on the reservations. But alongside the European religion, the rules of the Iroquois law survived in an almost underground existence for over 300 years. Grotesque false faces carved from living trees and representing supernatural beings with powers to cause and cure illness are worn by members of an exclusive healing society. The Iroquois make no distinction between religious activities and everyday life. In the Indian language, I don't think there is any, any Indian language that has the word religious in it. It translates to the way you live or a way of life. In other words, it's how you conduct yourself daily and continually. And so religion doesn't really uh, come as such. We, we can't separate it from our everyday activities. It's part of us and it's part of our function in our society. Some Iroquois ceremonies are described by an elder of the longhouse, Harry Watt. In the winter time, what we call the New Year's Festival. We have uh, doings there that covers about everything that we, we have to carry on from the old days. And uh, we do that about every, every year. And before we do anything like that, we have, uh, we have a meeting a religious meeting where everybody made right with their maker and uh, and then we 
continue. We go on to carry on what they have done way back. So uh, in uh, midwinter we have that, and then again in uh, planting time we have what they uh, call uh, the seed blessing, a seed dance. We have dance because whatever we do, we always have dancing. Whatever we do in, uh, in our uh, ceremonies is nothing but thanking our Maker. There is nothing else. We never say anything else. It's just thanking our Maker for everything that we do. We have uh, dancing because people have asked me why we dance so much. But I have told them that uh, it's, uh, it's nature for a person to maybe when you uh, do a good deed to one for one person, why uh, it makes you glad inside, makes you feel good. So you maybe you dance or shout or holler. That's the way it is. Laugh and uh, that's because you're glad, thankful for something that uh, happened. So that's the way we are. In 1776, the white colonists declared their independence from George III's government. The influential Iroquois League was wooed both by the rebellious colonists and the counter-attacking British, but official Iroquois policy was to remain neutral. When the Great War came about, when the father and son fought, and they asked the Six Nations to uh, fight, they both wanted us to fight on either side, the Six Nations decided not to fight. They said, we'll stand neutral and uh, we'll wait to see what the outcome is. We can't break our treaty with the king because we don't break treaties. We had um, somewhat like 80, 80 some odd treaties with other foreign nations before the United States became the United States. And um, we were international power. We were understood to be. There were diplomats that came from many countries to our doors. And we conducted business. And we had great strength, and we had, uh, that was the strength of the unity. And uh, also during this time, we gave to the colonies the concept of freedom, which you find here and about. You see the individual freedom, although it's, it's not conducted with regulation. You know, it's, it's kind of an oppressive freedom that they, that they have. But the uh, process of government was also given, not only to the men like Benjamin Franklin and John Adams and these people, but it was also given on later time to people like Engels and Marx. Despite official policy, several of the Six Nations fought on opposing sides in the Revolutionary War. This has repercussions today, for as a punishment, they were confined to reservations by the new United States government. Well, the first president of the United States, George Washington, gave the Senecas the land to be forever theirs. And uh, back in the early 1700s, uh, the early 1800s rather, a community sprang up and each individual leased land from the Seneca Nation. And then as time went on, why, it just, uh, the population increased and we're in the situation we're in today. So it's small white communities like Salamanca which are under pressure now, as the mayor, Keith Reed, explains. Right now we're in a 99-year lease that's due to expire in 1991, but it is guaranteed renewable for an additional 99 years. But the lending institutions feel that they expire in 1991 and that's it. They don't consider the fact they're guaranteed renewable so we can't get uh, federal backing on mortgage loans. 
and uh, we're trying to negotiate a new lease with the Senecas now in order to obtain financing both for uh, commercial and residential properties. While Salamanca is in the economic doldrums waiting for the outcome of negotiations where, for a change, the Indians have the upper hand, the Seneca nation itself is prospering. They received $15 million in compensation for the compulsory purchase of some of their land to build a dam. They've been investing this money in civic improvements. For example, this bowling alley, the first Indian-owned and operated bowling lane in the USA. The Senecas are conducting their lease negotiations with a thoroughly business-like approach. President of the Seneca Nation, Robert Hope. Uh, we feel that the city of Salamanca uh, is, uh, I guess, turned, could be a gold mine for the Seneca Nation of Indians. And I fully believe that myself, if things are handled right. Uh, <clears throat> it's not going to be a gold mine if we, uh, if, we, if we chase people out of the area. That's not going to help our situation one bit. And I've heard it said that, uh, well, would you be interested in taking over the city of Salamanca? Well, I, you know, I can't sit here and say whether we would or not. Uh, I believe that we have, uh, uh, I think we have the people, I think we have the, uh, the experience, the education, and the knowledge to, uh, to run uh, a facility like that. Uh, but that's, you know, that's not for me to really say whether that's the proper thing to do or not. I think uh, the best situation really is to negotiate another lease and you receive uh, X number of dollars every year from the city of Salamanca in a one lump sum payment type situation. And uh, I think that both sides, uh, if things are worked out, I think that both sides could come out of this feeling very happy. Some of the white inhabitants of Salamanca are not so happy about the way things are going. Keith Reed. Well, you've, you've got to have a scapegoat. <laughs> if, uh, even if you are at fault yourself, most of the average individual tries to blame it on either some person or some factor. And uh, most local people try to blame uh, the fact that the city of Salamanca has decreased in population since 1925 on the fact that we are on leased land. Now there's no way of knowing it for an absolute fact if that's the reason or if it's just because we're another rural community where people live and work in a larger city close by or uh, what the cause is. Of course everything uh, for the downfall of the city of Salamanca, uh, most of the blame has gone toward the Seneca Nation of Indians. Uh, because a lot of people do not understand what happened back in 1892. Or they don't understand the complications of a lease and renegotiate something so big. I mean, that's, it's a big chore to sit down. And first of all, we don't want to sit down, and particularly myself, I don't want to sit down with anybody unless I know what I'm talking about. And in order to do that, you have to have substantial backup information, and that's what we're attempting to do. When you say you want... Uh, so much a square foot for your property, you want to know that you've got backup information behind you to explain well, why is a 50 by 150 lot uh, worth so much money. But there is, there has been, there is friction and there has been friction and I would imagine there will continue to be some friction with uh, certain people uh, within the city limits of Salamanca. Well, I'm in a funny position because my, the Seneca Nation president, the present two-year term president, is my brother-in-law. And uh, kind of worried me. At a meeting one time I heard him say, when you're in a saddle, use the spurs. And that's just the way he operates. I, I mean, because I'm his brother-in-law, he doesn't pull any punches. And uh, at negotiations, they say what they think, and uh, they mean what they say. And uh, as the state has found out in negotiating with them for land to build Route 17 Expressway across the reservation, they drive a hard bargain. Of course, they're in a good position, too. Uh, I mean, uh, the state has got the throughway built right up to the reservation from both sides they've got to go through. So uh, they probably got far more. They negotiated harder because they knew they had the position.
The Iroquois always had a reputation, not just as formidable negotiators, but as terrifying warriors. Their cruelty to prisoners was legendary, though their reputation for sadism may have been the result of a misunderstanding of their desire to allow prisoners a noble death. Surrounding Indian tribes concluded treaties with them which were not in writing, but embodied in wampum belts, patterns of rare purple and white shellwork which symbolized the terms of the treaty. It was as much for their influence on other Indians as for their negotiating skills that the early colonists were eager to conclude treaties with the Iroquois, or on lions. They knew that to the west of them, in the forest, there was a great uh, nation or a confederate nation standing. And uh, everybody talked about it, and they were in great fear of it. And we were watching them constantly. And finally it came to the point where it was obvious that there was going to be a continuing interaction. And so we presented to them, at that particular time, a way to coexist. And we sat down and had a great discussion, because they came to us in this fear, and we said that, uh, you are, of course, equal, and uh, in response to that, we will make a great wampum belt. And so we sat down and we discussed, first of all, how we would, we would address one another, and that was as brothers. They asked that we would address them as fathers, and we said that by doing so, we would subject ourselves to their discipline as a father does to a son. So we would much rather it be on a brother basis, therefore we'd be equal, and we'd be able to conduct ourselves um, in a good way towards one another. And so this great belt was made. It was called a Gaswinta, a two-row wampum belt. It was on a field of white, about 30 inches long and about 80 inches wide. It had two strips of purple wampum down the sides. And one, the right strip, represented the Indian nation. All Indian people, and on the left, our white brothers, the two never came together. They coexisted in a field of white, of peace, in mutual respect. And one government would not interfere with the other, and the other government would not interfere with ours. And we called it our canoe and their boat. And uh, we called it a boat because they had so many other things in their boats. And our people looked ahead at that time. The chiefs looked way ahead. And they said, sometime, our people are going to be moving towards your boat because it carries so many things. The bright lights of the big cities, and perhaps more important jobs, are the sort of things some Indians see in the white man's boat. Many Indians have made successful careers in the white world. Iroquois from the Mohawk Reservation are unsurpassed as workers on the high steel of skyscraper construction. But the attractions of the modern world can bring dangers for the Indian, as Owen Lyons warns. Our canoe is very small, and it's very hard to live in our way of life, so we don't expect your people to be coming in our direction. But at some time, at a much later time, there are our people who will be standing with one foot in a canoe and one foot in the boat. And this is a very precarious position to be in. And then, at a further time, there's going to be a great wind, where they will spread apart, and those people will fall. They will fall into the, into the water, and they'll be swept away in the currents, and there will be no force on this side of the creation that will be able to save them. Whatever we do in, uh, in our uh, ceremonies is nothing but thanking our Maker there is nothing else. We never say anything else. It's just thanking our Maker for everything that we do. We have uh, dancing because people have asked me why we dance so much. But I have told them that uh, it's, uh, it's nature for a person to maybe when you uh, do a good deed to one, for one person, why uh, it makes you glad inside. 
makes you feel good. So you maybe you dance or shout or holler. That's the way it is. Laugh, and uh, that's because you're glad, thankful for something that uh, happened. So that's the way we are.